My name is uh, Michael King. I'm the co-director of the Scotiabank Digital Banking Lab at Ivy Business School. Uh, it's a pleasure to have so many people here from the public sector. As um, Let me introduce uh, a few people who are here with me. Um, we have Amy Young from Upside Consulting, who's been putting the event together. We have uh, JP Varen. JP is the other co-director of the Digital Banking Lab, uh, a finance, uh, pardon me, a strategy professor at, at Ivy Business School. And we have Chuck Grace in the back. Chuck, also at Ivy Business School, um, expert on wealth management and insurance. So as uh, we go forward today, please feel free to, uh, in the breaks or otherwise, to speak to us and we can tell you about the different events. Um, we, we've got a, a full agenda. All the speakers today have volunteered their time to be here. Um, this is part of a larger agenda that we have to try and promote uh, the fintech ecosystem in Canada. Um, the, let me tell you briefly about the Scotiabank Digital Banking Lab. We are at Canada's first university fintech research centre. So we uh, were founded a year ago with a $3 million gift from Scotiabank, but we are independent of Scotiabank. The, uh, the money from Scotiabank is for us to fulfill three objectives, outreach, research, and uh, education. This, uh, this event qualifies as outreach. We're doing a lot of events for students, both at Ivy as well as across Western University and across Ontario and Quebec. For example, we've been hosting a very large hackathon called Hack Western, where we had 500 students participating over a 48-hour challenge. We'll be doing that again this year. We're writing cases and creating uh, educational materials that are available globally through the Ivy Publishing Network. In terms of uh, other outreach events, we're doing a major speaker series every year featuring a high profile uh, thought leader. The next speaker is going to be Dino Trevisani, who is the president of IBM Canada. That will be taking place June the 1st in Toronto. It's a free event. Having uh, attended this event, you will receive an email asking you to register. IBM has been at the forefront in terms of cognitive computing using their artificial intelligence um, Watson as well as uh, their Blue Mix garages which uh, we'll, you'll hear about. They're also involved in what's called the Hyper Ledger project which is related to blockchain and distributed ledgers. Yeah. We're, we're hosting a, a practitioner conference again here in Toronto on June 23rd on the future of banking and financial services featuring speakers from industry um, both current and former. And then we have an academic conference which is going to be also in Toronto October 21st, 22nd. There's been a call for papers sent out globally to uh, universities across disciplines, not only finance, economics, strategy, uh, innovation, engineering, cryptography, all of these areas because this this area of fintech as we, we're going to talk about today is spanning all of these different uh, realms and um, it's it's hard to sort of get a view on the impact that it's going to have both for financial services as well as for the economy by simply looking at it with one lens. Okay. Um, JP already has a number of, uh, of publications out on our website. Um, for example, papers studying Bitcoin, the value of digital currencies such as Ethereum, what explains it, and, and he's working with several PhD students at Ivy um, who are doing research. All of this information is available for free on our website, which is there. We're one of uh, a number of research centers at Ivy, and uh, part of this event is going to be uh, posted there as well for your colleagues who aren't able to attend. My goal in, my, in the next 15 to 20 minutes is to sort of give you a framework for thinking about fintech, because later we're going to hear from founders and CEOs of fintech startups who are going to be coming in. We have a couple here already. Um, and I want to um, sort of talk about what do I mean by fintech? Okay? It's a word that's been used a lot. There's a tremendous amount of hype. Um, I use, there's no agreed definition of fintech. It's obviously a, uh, a portmanteau or a, a blend of the words financial technology. But what it refers to effectively is doing any kind of banking and financial services, either online or using your mobile phone. Okay, so digitally or electronically. This, uh, this diagram on the right is an example of uh, one of the many uh, companies that's tracking startups. Each of these small logos is a startup and the boxes are different 
segments of the fintech space. You can see that in the United States, there's obviously a tremendous number of fintechs that have been started. And the amount of funding in terms of seed capital, Series A, Series B, that's been invested has been growing exponentially, particularly over the past couple of years. Okay. There's an excellent report from Citibank that sort of provides that kind of overview. All of these slides will be made available uh, later on our, our the Digital Banking Labs website. Okay. But what do we have here in Canada? Well, in Canada, we actually have anywhere from uh, 200 to 300 startups. Um, you can see here Crowd Matrix, which is a, a, um, an equity crowdfunding startup. You'll be hearing from Rubs and Ho later. They're tracking these startups, and as you can see, um, the list is getting longer. Another thing to think about, not only startups, is also the supporting uh, ecosystem that I'm going to talk about. For example, incubators, accelerators, and hubs. Let me just take a moment to thank 111. Uh, 111 is the accelerator that you're in today. We have um, Emily Krauss at the back, who's our, our hostess, and you'll be hearing from Bilal Khan later today talking about uh, the work that 111 is doing on a panel. Uh, 111, if you don't know it, is where uh, Paycase, one of the payment startups that we're talking, you'll be hearing from today, is based. They're actually around just on this floor. It was also a spot where Borrow Well and Well Simple were both uh, were, were uh, part of this accelerator. Okay. It's not exclusive to fintech. A lot of these accelerators are, are covering many different types of technologies. Okay. Um, you'll also be hearing from, uh, for example, ScaleUp later today, as well as from Mars. Um, Dinara Lai, uh, Lee, who is the director of the fintech cluster, is at the back there and is going to be uh, available uh, and speaking later. Let me help you think about fintech. I want you to think of a three by three um, matrix. The first three are the different types of businesses. Okay. You can think of uh, products and services that are being offered, such as digital currencies, lending or provision of credit, so-called peer-to-peer lending or marketplace lending. We're going to hear from uh, both Lending Loop. Uh, we have Pedro uh, Cato Pastol, who's the founder here, speaking later, as well as uh, Kevin, uh, sorry, Troy Wright, who is the uh, co-founder of Lendified. Those, those kind of platforms are, are providing credit in the same way that uh, a bank might or um, a, uh, another part of the financial system. You also have wealth management, such as robo-advisors. We're going to be hearing from um, Randy Cass at Nest Wealth. Okay. Wealth Simple is another example. There is also uh, insurance, real estate, accounting. So any kind of product that you might find offered by a traditional incumbent or um, you know, a bricks and mortar financial services firm. Okay. There's a second, which is really the, the part that people are perhaps less aware, which is about the infrastructure and the payments. Okay. You can think of that as the plumbing. Um, it's obviously a very large and, uh, as we'll see, a very important part of this um, fintech space because payments and money transfer are, uh, are uh, very important. We have blockchain, which is a technology that we'll be talking about later. We'll be hearing from, uh, from uh, Matthew Spoke from Nuco. There's also uh, um, platforms that allow companies to either issue, uh, issue debt directly from investors to, um, sorry, from companies to investors, acting as kind of a real estate you know, just providing the platform to allow transparency amongst the, the participants. Cybersecurity, we're going to hear from SecureKey later. And these are, um, these are if you like, supporting um, infrastructure for this whole fintech ecosystem. Lastly, there's a new area, which is uh, perhaps the newest, which is regulation and procurement. And you hear terms like regtech and proctech. The other dimension I want you to think about is who their customers are. Okay, and most businesses will either be in the B to C space, business to consumer, or the business to business space. But there is also a consumer to consumer space. The consumer to consumer space, uh, for example, is international uh, remittances or electronic funds transfer from one individual to another. Um, Paycase is an example of that kind of uh, payments um, startup. Business to consumer are the ones that perhaps have become the most high profile because they actually involve the public and they're the ones that are getting most of the attention. Those are the ones that are actually trying to deal with households and retail and perhaps the ones that are raising the most issues in terms of consumer protection and, and, um, and the like. 
a number of, of businesses that started in the business to consumer space have actually started to move, they, they would say evolve, uh, we might say pivot, to move into the business to business space. Okay? And that is where you're actually working with the incumbents, whether the banks or the financial, the insurance companies, providing them with solutions for them to uh, address their customers. And we're going to hear examples of that again in the wealth management, um, uh, blockchain, um, payments, as well as cybersecurity spaces. This is um, a, a diagram of what a fintech ecosystem looks like. It's taken from a report that was commissioned by the UK government from Ernst & Young. It effectively shows in the four yellow circles what the kind of key characteristics or attributes that you need to be successful are to have an entire fintech ecosystem. But you may not be able to see it. The, the, the dark gray circles around the outside represent, for example, on the, on the right, on the left, pardon me, capital. We have angel investors, venture capitalists, and then the exit through an IPO. When it comes to talent, you have universities, you have entrepreneurs, you have technology firms. When it comes to demand, you've got uh, traditional financial institutions as well as uh, consumers who are, are purchasing, as well as corporates and government. And in some countries, government procurement is one of the main ways that they're trying to scale up these startups by requiring governments at the, pro the federal, provincial, and municipal levels to actually use fintech in their day-to-day -day operations. Okay. And at the bottom, we obviously have policy, which incorporates both the regulators as well as the government. Okay. So that's how people in the space are thinking about the ecosystem. This is just one example. Um, because we have this relationship with Scotiabank, we were invited to participate in their Digital Investor Day, which was a half-day event where Brian Porter and his team basically laid out their whole strategy for their digital transformation. And one of the most striking graphics that I found was all of these relationships that they've built. What this, these logos show is that it's not only partnering with universities like ourselves, University of Toronto, Queens, St. Mary's University, Stanford. They're also partnering with a lot of startups. Okay, so you'll see Sensible up there. You will see Cabbage, which is coming from the United States. Confio, which is in Mexico. Deep Learning, which is an artificial intelligence startup. They're also working with people you might see as competitors, such as Facebook, Google, as well as other large sort of technology companies, such as Cisco or Oracle. Another dimension is venture capitalists, and in this case, they've partnered with Georgian Partners. Georgian Partners has been in the press recently because of their specialization in artificial intelligence. QED is another uh, source of venture capital. And lastly, they're part of a number of industry consortiums. So this is banks and other financial institutions that are cooperating to develop networks globally. A good example is Ripple, which is a startup that allows international money transfers, or the R3 consortium, which is a, a consortium of financial institutions that are looking to build a blockchain for use between banks. I mentioned briefly capital as a main source of the ecosystem. This is a chart we borrowed from White Cap Venture Partners, and it effectively shows you a number of names of uh, firms that are uh, in, involved at different levels of, of the startup. You may find some names here that you uh, should be added. Some of them have actually left. Um, Omers is moving into from late growth into earlier angel uh, investments. You see here, for example, BDC, Omers are large government or public sector funds investing in this space. And you also see funds such as ScaleUp, which have uh, attracted money from banks, from industrial firms like Rogers Communications. So it's a very complete and growing list. Canada is not alone in terms of having a fintech cluster. There is now a global association or federation of fintech clusters, and you can see that it is every country around the world. You'll notice that Mars is there. These clusters are collaborating and cooperating to help startups move globally. There are a lot of reports being done by consulting firms, as well as accounting firms such as Deloitte, um, Ernst & Young, looking at this space. This is a report looking at Canada and how Canada is doing. And as you can see, they've assigned a score to Canada as a hub, which shows that Canada is somewhere between Sydney and Shanghai in terms of the score. 
The score is based on three parts, innovation, the financial center, and, and the ease of doing business. Each of these dimensions is rated where one bar is low, five bars is high, and they've tried to assess where Canada is doing well, such as proximity to customers, culture of innovation, and where Canada is doing poorly, such as government support or uh, regulation. This is obviously a dynamic, this is the 2016 report, and we'll be seeing these changes year by year. But startups are, are watching this when deciding where to go and where to set up. One thing that Amy Young and I have been talking about is, um, is Canada's fintech strategy, or lack of it. So we started meeting with stakeholders last November. We met, we met with 18 stakeholders from the banks, power financial, federal, provincial governments, and we, we asked them who is responsible for Canada's fintech strategy. We also met with, uh, we've subsequently met with startups, regulators, venture capitalists, and we've asked them, what are the obstacles that you see to us having a successful, vibrant ecosystem? And generally, we get very good reports that Canada has everything. We have the sound financial system, we have the large banks, we have uh, a lot of innovation, access to talent. What seems to be missing is the absence of a clearly defined strategy for fintech and a champion at the federal level. So let me briefly talk to you about uh, two examples that are we can look at to model what we should be thinking about, Australia and the UK. Australia is particularly relevant because they're in many ways similar to Canada. Provincial system with different states, a uh, small number of large incumbent banks, okay, relatively uh, advanced, uh, similar endowments in terms of talent. Okay. The UK obviously uh, much larger. The UK actually took about two years to develop their strategy and it, it didn't start with the government. It actually started with uh, the private sector working with Accenture and launching a competition called the FinTech Innovation Lab. Now the City of London and a new association was formed to basically try and promote this. But relatively quickly it moved up to the Prime Minister's office and Prime Minister Cameron started meeting with participants in this ecosystem as well as Chancellor Osborne. And what they identified was an opportunity to seize a new segment of financial services and have it based in the UK. They, they got the, the equivalent of international trade in the UK, industry, uh, trade and industry, sort of a blend of ICID and international trade. They sent up an organization specifically to attract fintech startups. They got the Financial Conduct Authority, which is responsible for um, dealing with retail or consumers, and they set up the first so-called sandbox as well as a concierge service to help fintech startups navigate regulation, which was called Project Innovate, as well as an innovation hub. And then the chancellor launched an industry body effectively to advise the government, made up of 50 members, and as you can see, it was both at the city, the municipal level as well as the national level and they commissioned the study which I mentioned earlier. The UK has outlined these elements of the strategy and if you look down the list you can see that Canada has ticks off most of them such as an entrepreneurial uh, you know visa scheme. We now in Ontario have OSC Launchpad which is the Canadian version of the sandbox. We're going to hear from Pat Chalkos who is the chief of OSC Launchpad in a moment. We have, uh, they found, they identified that uh, there was an, a lack of good working space at a reasonable cost as well as access to lawyers and accountants and other things that you need for a startup. What they did do though is they did create an industry panel and they tried to identify the niches that they want to be specializing in. Okay? The idea is that you can't be everything to all people. You have to look at your comparative advantage and identify where you want to be. Now, if I say cybersecurity, you're probably thinking Israel. Okay, so Israel has decided that that is the area where they're going to specialize. The UK has picked certain areas, one of which is um, regulation or reg tech. The government actually imposed a new regulation that will allow startups to get data from customers called Open API. And this is modeled on the European Union's Payment System Directive 2, or which is going to allow consumers to give, their, give access to their data to anyone that uh, any financial services firms, including startups. 
And this is quite revolutionary because it obviously covers many, um, many countries. It's the whole European Union. It was passed and they, the banks have two years to comply with this. It's going to be put into law and regulations across the European Union, which means that startups will be able to, if you agree, get access to your data and use that for developing products and uh, beta testing new uh, products for customers. They've also been very active in terms of uh, doing research and promoting reports. These are a number of different studies that they've done from different areas of the UK government. Interestingly, they actually went abroad and they started identifying startups in Australia and Canada that they would like to have relocate to the UK. Okay, so in December of last year, they actually flew 10 Canadian startups, all expenses paid for a five day road show into the UK where these companies here, where they met with the city of London, they met with venture capitalists in level uh, 49, they, they basically were given a concierge service to three banks and they were pitched to basically leave Canada and set up in the UK. Several of them have actually started relationships immediately uh, with banks in the UK such as Sensibil. Others have come back and said they want to stay here and, be, and be, um, remain in Canada. But this is the kind of competition that we're going to see for the talent that we have in Canada. There was a report done by Innovation, uh, Innovate Finance that actually looked at one of the things that the UK is rating very highly on is government support for fintech. Australia actually has done a very similar thing, but they've done it much more rapidly because Australia, after their 10 startups were flown over to the UK, they quickly decided they needed to come up with a strategy nationally. Initially, the, the impetus for their national strategy came from the regional government of New South Wales, where Sydney is based. Okay, so similar to, uh, you can think of it as the Ontario government. But it was then taken up to the level of the, of the equivalent of the finance minister, the treasurer, who basically put out a report that outlined all the elements that they need to back Australian fintech. Now, Australia has a very small population, so you would think that they can't scale up domestically. That's what you always hear about Canada. So what they've decided is they're going to create fintechs that are born global, where the government is going to support them as an export industry. And what they also are going to do is they're going to involve regulators up front in the design of their, of their platforms so that they're regulation ready and that the regulators in Australia, ASIC, ASIC I believe, is, is signed memorandums of understanding with regulators in other countries, such as the UK, Singapore and Hong Kong. And uh, the OSC has been active in pursuing those on behalf of Canada. Now, you can see that there's a lot of elements, but one of the key things, start with a strategy, and because the government doesn't usually have all the expertise, set up an advisory panel. So this is just something for you to take away, which we've created uh, you know, based on the work that's been done by Ernst & Young. It's a checklist of where we should be looking, you know, how are we doing in terms of different areas. Um, it just shows you that there's a lot of sort of very concrete elements that we can focus on in terms of uh, promoting this. Like at universities, Chuck, JP and I, our, our goal is to develop learning materials and educate the workforce. Okay, that's, that's our comparative advantage. When it comes to venture capitalists, obviously uh, raising money through uh, venture capital funds is, is crucial. When it comes to policy, there's obviously things that can be done at all levels, both uh, regulation, government, as well as tax policy. There's also a lot to be done in terms of creating demand and part of that will be educating consumers about the safety and the usefulness of fintech to create a domestic market. But also getting adoption from both corporate and financial institutions as well as a major, major source that Australia has identified is government procurement. We have, you know, a number of these. We can tick the box on some of them but not all of them. So here's, here's my good news, bad news story for you. Canada does have two reports that have been done of our ecosystem. One commissioned by the Toronto Financial Services Alliance, looking at Toronto. It was the Monk report. And then another one commissioned by Finance Montreal, looking at Montreal's fintech system. So the good news is that we have interest in both two, and I believe Vancouver may have one as well. There is a third report being done uh, by Accenture um, for Toronto, which will be coming out May, May 12th, I believe. The bad news is, why does Canada have reports for each of our major cities? Why do we not have a national report? There was no report for London versus Edinburgh. There was no report for Sydney versus Melbourne. So what's happening is that a lack of leadership at the top is leading to individual cities to promote regional strategies that will potentially be in conflict with each other, which is what we saw with the initial announcement of the artificial investment hubs 
which came out, you may have seen the Vector Institute. They set it up in Edmonton, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, and Montreal. The announcement came last week. And initially, the PR around that was that they were all arguing with each other because who put out the press release first? What I'm trying, we're trying to get at is this is Canada against the world. This is not Vancouver against Montreal. We should be trying to pull together all our resources nationally in order to keep this industry in Canada and to export it as a source of wealth for us and for future generations. So let me just tell you briefly where the, we stand in terms of Canada. And uh, this is not comprehensive, but I did do a, a, a major search through Factiva of press releases. Kind of the ma first major thing in terms of fintech was Mars setting up their fintech cluster. And then uh, the Digital Finance Institute creating the first conference. We had the, uh, the Canadian banks with the R3 consortium as well as the Monk School. And when you look at the March 2016 budget, that budget obviously had a big focus on the middle class. This is a year ago. There was, uh, it was 270 pages. There was, the word innovation appeared 76 times. The word fintech or financial technology did not appear once. We then had the Competition Bureau, of which some members are here, launch the, uh, the, um, the, the study of potential anti-competitive behavior in this space from the incumbents. FinTrack, which is responsible for uh, anti-money laundering and other in international payments, rather than sort of promoting payments, which has been a strength in Canada, has come out and saying, we're concerned that these fintechs may be uh, violating the rules. The OSC has taken leadership in terms of launching OSC Launchpad. Um, I'm not aware, but perhaps Pat can speak to this, about what regulators in other provinces are doing. I mentioned the UK flying across the Canadian fintechs, and the OSC has also launched, uh, now has an advisory council, which is met twice. So in the budget that came out uh, only a few days ago, again, there's a major source of focus on the middle class, on innovation, clean tech, agri-tech. The budget itself, it, it's now 280 pages, mentions of innovation, 270, mentions of fintech, three. Okay, so this is clearly not on the radar screen. I, I used the opportunity to corner the uh, Minister of Finance, Minister Morneau, when he was at Ivy last week, and I gave him our note, and I'll be going to Ottawa to speak to them about Canada's fintech strategy on uh, May the 1st. And I would encourage you to bring it up at every opportunity because we need a national strategy. Let me uh, briefly conclude because I don't want to spend too much time. I'd like to actually uh, invite, uh, in five minutes, I'll invite um, our next speaker up. When people keep asking me what's new about fintech, and I keep saying, well, not a lot because financial services firms have been investing for three decades enormously in, in back office, in automation, you can see how the world of stock exchanges has changed, how there's algorithmic trading, high frequency trading, how uh, institutions such as the NYC have seen their, their market share tumble because of startups based in Kansas, such as BATS or Kayaks, stealing all their, their trading, subsequently getting acquired by these startups. Most of what FinTech is doing is actually reducing cost for banks. It's simply automating tasks. It is creating new product offerings though. It is, it is helping consumers to look at their finances in a different way. So when you think about these businesses, one way I think about them is, are they actually engaged as a principal face-to-face, -face, whether it's a retail customer or a corporate customer? By that, if I think of a, a market maker such as uh, Goldman Sachs or you know, one of the capital markets areas of the banks, they basically hold an inventory of bonds, they make prices for institutional investors, they take risk holding those bonds, they buy and sell. Or you can think of uh, a bank making loans to industrial and commercial loans or household loans where they actually take on credit risk. Okay? They are a part of the, um, they're not simply an agent or a broker who is not taking risk but getting paid fees and commissions, which is what a lot of these platforms are doing. Okay? If, you go to, if you go to Nest Financial, they'll put your money into ETFs that someone else manages. Okay? They are not the portfolio manager of the ETF. They are providing a service and they get paid a fee. Much like when you buy a house, the real estate agent does not buy the house from you and then sell it. They actually just bring the buyer and the seller together and take a fee. So the risks around those businesses are, are quite different from businesses such as insurance where you, you take premiums up front and you pay out on claims. Now, obviously, those kind of businesses are the ones that perhaps can create both micro-prudential risks as well as macro-prudential, such as systemic. But for these, particularly agency and back office, there's very little. Okay? And here, like a, a traditional depository, such as the Canadian Depository for Securities, DTCC, they, they will hold securities in, in uh, electronic name for you and I, make sure that we receive our dividends and our proxy statements. Effectively, that's what these startups are, are going to um, facilitate in a much more cost-effective fashion, eliminating levels of cost, making it available at a much cheaper rate, perhaps to consumers, 
which should be welfare enhancing. There is obviously going to be reputation risk, operational and systemic. I mean, by reputation, I mean getting hacked, cybersecurity risks, those are important risks, but they're not going to bring down the financial system. Okay, and I think we have to keep that in mind when thinking about how we approach these businesses. I'm actually, um, these slides, I'm going to make them available online, but I have been talking to a lot of the banks about how to think about this, and I just want to briefly conclude by providing the, the bank or the incumbent perspective, because you're going to be hearing a lot from startups today, okay? from CEOs and founders who are either competing directly or working with them. So the banks can view fintech as something that can really help their businesses because the banks actually have very, very aggressive targets in Canada in terms of earnings per share growth and ROE that are not sustainable in a world of 2% growth. You cannot grow earnings at 5 to 10% when the economy is growing at 1 to 2% unless you continue to cross-sell to existing consumers. And as we've seen, the number of products that consumers have, the average consumer has gone from three to five to now seven to 10. So you get more credit cards, more checking accounts, more mutual funds, more insurance. And they're earning a lot of that through fees and, fees and uh, commissions. And that's what's led to this upselling scandal that we heard about through the banks over the past month. Okay? But they can't do that forever because household debt levels are at, at, at historically high levels. So they have to go abroad. Okay, they have no other way to grow at these rates or they have to manage their costs and do everything more efficiently. And in this case, fintech can help with both. You can automate things to allow banks to, uh, for example, example, attract cheaper deposits, reduce overhead, figure out ways to take out layers of inefficiencies in your organization. Most of the investment that's actually going into this space is looking to disrupt those incumbents. You see that on the, on the right hand side, this is where the global pool of profits for banks globally is. Uh, around 46% comes from personal and small business enterprises, and that has attracted around three quarters of all the investment for startups. Okay, so clearly the investment is targeting that segment. Notice that corporate banking accounts for 35% and has attracted 3% of the capital. Okay, so it's really retail and small business that's attracting all the attention, which is why it's become so prevalent in the media. McKinsey has, has put out this report that suggests that 60% of global banking profits are at risk, which is not an accurate reflection of what they actually said. What they actually said was origination and sales represents around 60% of banks' profits and that fintechs are targeting that segment. Fintechs have only acquired 1% of that business. So the banks have sort of gone from being feeling like they're at threat to actually recognizing that they're not at threat because there are huge, huge moats around the banks that are preventing them from being disrupted. Cost of customer acquisition, stable funding, regulatory hurdles that small startups are finding, cybersecurity trust, talent. So they've just simply started to partner with these startups, which is why I mentioned a lot of them you'll hear are, uh, many are, are partnering as opposed to um, competing. And so you see many partnerships being uh, CIBC Borrowell, Power Financial Wealth Simple, JP Morgan on deck, maybe white labeling their products. And effectively, these, these startups are providing a better customer experience digitally that the banks can then offer to their customers less expensively, allowing them to go into foreign markets without having a brick and mortar presence, uh, which is what um, Scotiabank's doing in Mexico, Peru, Chile, and Colombia, or um, offering customers an alternative to a high. For example, robo-advice, BMO, for example, has their own robo-advice called Smartfolio, which competes with their own business of investment advisors who are selling mutual funds. It's natural that regulators have to play catch up. That's always the nature of things, and that's why we hope uh, we're glad to have you here.